Okay, so we are going to start the, the last session of today. Um, so tomorrow you are going to be working in groups uh, discussing all the um, normative issues that, that and practically justifying all the normative decisions that we uh, that Sabina had uh, walk us through. But before that, um, uh, Adriana, Anna, and Hika and myself thought that it would be a good idea to talk you through some of these uh, decisions uh, that happen in four different countries that have implemented the uh, multidimensional poverty measure. And And this is the, the, the list of normative decisions. Um, and we, we will be discussing this for the four cases. So in the case of, of Mexico, uh, we decided this uh, to follow this presentation, which is kind of chronologically the way in which uh, they, they were developed. And in the case of, of Mexico, I'm using uh, some of the slides uh, from Gonzalo Hernández Licona, who is the uh, director of Coneval, uh, an independent institution who is in charge of, the, of, of carrying out multidimensional poverty measurement and also policy evaluation. Um, the purpose of the measure was actually to implement the 2004 General Law of Social Development that was approved by the, co by the government after four years of discussion and support of the uh, three well, actually, it was of the six parties in, in represented in the Congress at that time. And the first estimation uh, was out in 2009. So can you imagine, uh, it was actually, it, the discussions started in one at, at the beginning of one administration, and the first estimation went uh, uh, halfway through the following administration. So it was a, a long way, and, and there are, important reasons why this happened. Um, the dimensions included in this measure are establishing the law. And as you can imagine, it was a uh, very uh, thorough discussion of how this law would include dimensions to measure poverty. Um, and this, this is why it took several years to pass through the Congress and more years to get implemented. Um, the household was set as unit of, of analysis. As I go through the dimensions and indicators, uh, it will become clear why. Um, and then uh, the law establishes that in order to be considered poor, uh, you have a, a person would have to be uh, deprived in an economic well-being, uh, in their social rights. And also, uh, in, in a dimension of social cohesion. We will discuss uh, slightly uh, more about this later. Um, the law also establishes some uh, resources so, um, uh, to implement all these new measurements and, and a new institution that is independent. Um, but um, but there, um, when, when Sabina was asking you about uh, potential conflict that can arise with these exercises, well, uh, the first conflict came when uh, they realized uh, that actually they didn't have any source of information to put into practice or what the uh, le legislative power had uh, have, uh, idealized as the best way to measure poverty in Mexico. Uh, they had um, an old survey uh, called, uh, well, the an income and expenditure survey that had a thorough information about income of households, but it didn't have access, uh, information on access to food or um, access to health insurance, uh, not even social cohesion. So there, there was a lot of, uh, at well, at least, uh, two or three years of negotiation on how this information would be collected. And in the end, the, uh, the survey was adapted. And, and this is how uh, they came up to measure poverty. Uh, this is, I, I think this is important because you will see uh, the following examples actually built on information available. Um, so uh, 
since the late 90s, Mexico had been uh, measuring food, uh, sorry, uh, economic well-being in a thorough way. They had discussed, this, they have a governmental space to discuss axiomatic properties of the income poverty measure. They, the, they, the, they adapted a food basket that has a minimum economic well-being and uh, that has all the caloric requirements uh, uh, for, a, for a household and that it's also adapted to urban uh, and, and rural settings. Then there is a higher food uh, um, poverty line. Uh, well, th sorry, there is a higher food basket that gives us a result, a, a slightly higher poverty line of economic well-being. And this includes this, uh, all of this food basket plus um, necessary goods and services. This is education and health. And ad ad again, it's adapted to urban and rural services. Uh, sorry, urban and rural settings. And um, when the legislators were discussing the multidimensional poverty measure, uh, they also went to the experts that had already gone through this discussion, and they didn't want um, they didn't want to actually replace the the this expertise that the Mexican government had. So they built upon this um, poverty line. This is our this are income poverty lines, although based on, uh, on the amount of money that you need to purchase uh, this specific food basket. Um, and they, they <coughs> included this uh, income poverty line in the measure. They knew exactly how many Mexicans were deprived in the higher income poverty line, which is the half of the population. But the minimum one, uh, it's only 20% of the, roughly 20% of the population who were deprived on that, on that income poverty line. Um, I see some, uh, yeah, well, uh, yes. yes. I, was, I was wondering, you're questioning two poverty lines, are they in the law of poverty lines? Yes, yes, exactly. Actually, there were three. <laughs> and at some point, there were four. <laughs> uh, so, um, the in, in early 2000s. But um, uh, but uh, probably a picture in a few slides uh, uh, later will make these things clearer. Yes. So um, so uh, but as I was saying, the legislator were uh, very concerned about social rights. It's not only income what makes you poor, but uh, lack of access to these social rights, and they uh, based on articles in the Constitution, uh, the article number three uh, specifies that every citizen should have access to a free education. So they uh, selected educational gap as one of the fundamental rights that should be uh, achieved, by, well, I mean, the one of the fundamental rights that should be protected by law. Um, access to health is um, justifying uh, for uh, article four of the constitutions. Uh, the Article 123 justifies the access to social security and work, uh, although here is just a uh, concern about uh, access to social security. Access to food does not uh, is not uh, protected by the Constitution, but it's uh, fundamentally um, uh, justified under the Declaration of Rome for um, uh, World Food Security of 1996. Um, Quality of living as spaces is justified under the uh, Article Four of the cons Constitution. That also justifies uh, it. It just basically protects every individual should have the right to access uh, good quality of housing and with house basic housing services. So, um, as you can see, uh, the um, the legislators have a very important um, justification of these rights. Um, however, at the moment of selecting indicators, well, they, uh, the, the administrative or executive power realized that they didn't have all of this information together. 
So this is why uh, an adaptation of an old survey was needed. Furthermore, do you remember that I mentioned at the beginning there was a social cohesion dimension? Well, it, this is still on the law, but uh, after thorough uh, discussion, they have not come to agree how this can be assessed at individual level. They argue that uh, social cohesion is uh, something that has to be assessed at community level, municipality, or even regional level, but it doesn't reflect the individual unit of analysis or the household unit of analysis. So in the end, the social cohesion didn't make made it to the very last uh, measure, and what is done now, it's reported together with, um, with the aggregation of poverty in the, in the country. So this was another, uh, some sort of source of conflict of, uh, in the measure because some there, there were people that were defending it should be included at individual basis, but there was no clear uh, cut on how to measure it at individual basis that what's meaningful of what social cohesion means. And they also had their uncensored headcounts. Um, I don't want to spend much, much time on these numbers, but to go to the slide <laughs> that I thought about, the one that uh, um, Sabine also mentioned that how to justify the, cutoff, the um, K cutoff uh, on axiomatic um, principles. And the axiomatic principle, it, sounds it, it is quite simple, it's just a Mexican is the considered to be poor if he's deprived of well-being, and if he is uh, deprived of at least one of the social rights that are protected by law. So on the x-axis uh, or horizontal axis, we have the dimensions of social rights <coughs> from zero to six. I know, uh, um, I know this is a different way of labeling, but it, uh, it, makes, it makes our understanding easier. And on the white axis or vertical axis, we have the income that household earns. And this is the poverty line, income poverty line, uh, uh, I'm sorry. So when people earn when or ha when household earn lower than this income, and when and at the same time when households are deprived in one and at least one dimensions or or more social rights, they are considered as multidimensional poor. Um, is it uh, slightly clearer now? In most of the countries, the constitution says good for every, everything is good for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and if I try to un, uh, estimate poverty using has based the constitution, I should do it with the ticket to leave the country as I presented the results. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that means that in some countries there are more specific documents that are much below the constitution that set targets and priorities for intervention. <coughs> and that it, it help, somehow it should help more to focus on what to cut rather than the Constitution. The Constitution says everything is good for everyone. You're absolutely right. Actually, that was discussed as well when, when, when the, uh, during ne the negotiation of the law, uh, the Constitution uh, uh, secures the right of, a, of good housing, not, not not to measure the quality of housing, but some people don't even have a house. So, um, so are you going to give a house to every every citizen? Are you? Uh, do you have the budget and the infrastructure to do that? Obviously, this is not considered when when like well, this is less of a problem when when legislators are setting aims. But I guess uh, um, obviously uh, the um, when when the 
um, the regulation of the law came into into practice, then all this reality uh, has has to be, or uh, better said, all these a big aims had to be adapted to reality. Um, as you, uh, you are right in mentioning that there are uh, specific laws that say how to go about it. So uh, probably, I if I, I could go back and, and mention that uh, actually, uh, the for instance, the general law for education mentions that uh, compulsory education in Mexico uh, is up to six years old for people born before 1982, but it's uh, uh, up to 12 years uh, of education for people born after eight 1982. So. Uh, I was born in 1981, <laughs> so I, I am I, I am under the uh, uh, yeah of of one law and in other law, and and this is considered when when the measure was was built up. Uh, uh, we're in election time now outside this uh, coach, so I don't know what's going to happen to me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Constitution be uh, take some part of the human rights that they were declared like in, it was like accept internationally. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's why they took those those dimension and that's why they are in the Constitution of Mexico as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Anna. Uh, there are, uh, you know, there are studies that indicate. Uh, Different powers measures, most are not quite dissimilar measures as good. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a low overlap between mountain and non mountain measures. Mm -hmm. And uh, using these methods is somewhat problematic, isn't it? The overlap between uh, you if need. There is a low overlap between powers measures, income and, and deprivation. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, at the moment, it, uh, there is there is a, a good overlapping. Uh, we will see the figures, but uh, you can see that this is this uh, square is very s is very small. So most of of the overlap uh, occurs here, because uh, all these people are considered poor by the old income measure. Uh, not not in terms of figure, uh, in terms of percentage of. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Actually, this. What uh, is the overlapping ratio between uh, income and uh, material deprived or uh, socially deprived? Yes. So, for instance, only four percent, uh, roughly. Uh, um, and the next slide uh, has has the figures as uh, exactly, but roughly four to five percent of people are income poor. Mm -hmm. But uh, in this in this small square. But they are not multidimensional poor. Um, so ca can uh, um, can can you see why? Because they are under this income poverty line, but they are not uh, depriving any social right. <coughs> so they are income poor, but they are not multi multidimensional poor. But it's a very very small percentage. It's only four percent of the of the population. So. So most of the people identify as multidimensional poor. They are also then they were also identified previously as an as income poor. No, no worries. Um, furthermore, uh, there was a question about two income poverty lines. So um, they they also consider that having an income even lower than than this income cutoff would be would be very uh, would highlight extreme poverty, and having the privations that go further three would be al also very problematic and very and would highlight very a uh, very uh, dangerous situation. So they created uh, the the another concept of extreme poverty, in which not having the minimum income to attain the food all the calorie consumption per person in your household would put and have you having uh, three or more so social deprivations in social rights would put you in this group. Uh, otherwise, uh, well, if you are 
under the income poverty line and have one social or one or more social deprivations, you are considered mod moderately moderately poor. Again, vulnerable, vulnerable people by income, but not multidimensional uh, poor, are in this in this square. Uh, vulnerable people by social deprivations, but with sufficient income to attain uh, basic food and health and education needs are uh, on this quadrangle. And uh, this, this green quadrangle is where all uh, people would aim to be, uh, which is the, the best uh, state with no income and no social rights deprivations. And the, uh, well, now we have uh, the figures here. And uh, by now, there well, this is 2010 uh, results, but uh, 2012 results are have been released recently. And with 2008 results, were which were the first ones uh, to be obtained. Well, there are uh, now three uh, time uh, periods of time in which this has been evaluated. Um, roughly half of the population are considered to be in um, multidimensional poverty. Um, roughly uh, a third of the population are only moderately poor. But 10% uh, of the population are suffering extreme poverty. And, and you can see that uh, both uh, the uh, A, uh, so this is the average deprivation uh, among the, um, well, obviously this is the average deprivation uh, over the poverty line, but uh, here is the average deprivation among the extreme poor is 3.7, and the average deprivation among the moderately multidimensional poor are two is 2.5. Um, and there, are, uh, sorry, I, I just want to go quickly through this uh, because it talks us about the institutional uh, challenges but also the institutional goals. Um, so changes in the number of poor in, in Mexico show a uh, decrease in the number of social, de social rights deprivation. But importantly in 2010 food security was a social right that suffered an increase in the number of people suffering it. And along with income poverty and in extreme income poverty those were the uh, figures that were uh, increasing in numbers of people. So this le led to the, the government to create um, a food security cabinet or um, cabinet uh, Mexico Incluyente and a national uh, plan against hunger. And uh, I remember one of the questions uh, at the beginning of, of the of the sessions was, shall we, um, do, do we want to, um, why do we want to include the health minister if they, they are going to do this, their own job and, uh, and the education minister and the housing minister? Um, well, uh, on, word, uh, on, the, on, the, on the very words of the, of the head of the social department of the Ministry of Social Development in Mexico, she said, well, I'm very happy that now they are all coming on board because beforehand, when I had all these uh, negative figures on food security and income poverty, all the press was uh, coming to me and asked me for explanations. But now, uh, food access uh, includes uh, agriculture, health, education, and uh, and child services. So I'm very happy that this is not no longer the case. Um, yeah. Hello. So I'm going to come and talk a little bit of the case of Colombia. So how Colombia addressed the normative decisions in creating their own measure. <coughs> I'll be showing mostly slides or information from slides from Roberto Angulo Salazar, who actually was one of the persons who designed the measure. So, how did this measure come about? There was a, the start, the people in Colombia, they were starting, to, the people, the politicians, starting to think about, rethinking about the methodologies to measure poverty and tackle poverty. In that context, they want to do a design a strategy or for the reduction of poverty and inequality that would take into account the magnitude and uh, uh, the, they would take into account both sides, both the income and the multidimensional poverty. 
in this context, Roberto, that was working at the, uh, the, the National Department, the, the National Department, National Planning Department, <laughs> uh, they did, did develop uh, the MPI, the Colombian MPI. And in 2011, the Colombian president, Juan Manuel Santos, has launched the national strategy, the national development plan, who they had at the core the reduction of poverty. And one of the measures that was there to, to track progress and even to, to define the, uh, the, that was used to define the goals was the MPI, the Colombian MPI. So in the end, this measure, the main purpose, the first, like the first normative decision, the purpose is, to tool, is a tool to monitor progress towards the goals that were defined in the National Development Plan. Now, the, there is like nati the National Department of Statistics is the uh, organ organism <coughs> responsible to compute the measure annually. Unit of analysis. The unit of analysis in Colombia is the household. What does this mean? It means that we it, the poverty status is identified at the level of the household. So we define they find out if the household is poor or not, and then all the members of the household will have the same status as the household. Why? They use three criteria. A normative criteria. So accor according to the constitution of, of Colombia, the guarantee of living conditions and rights is the joint responsibility of the family, the society and the state. So they thought like, no, the family is a, 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 a relevant unit, is the unit of analysis. But they also have empirical evidence that historically, in fighting to adverse conditions was then at the household level. So individuals don't face adverse situ like catastrophes or crisis individually. It's the household that responds jointly. So they thought that was another I reason to incorporate as a household. And last, social policy. So most of their programs, uh, Familias in uh, Nación, Unidos, have the, all the programs that they have to tackle poverty, they also target, target at the, unit, the household level. So they also have the household as the unit of reference. Dimensions. So they select dimensions that would reflect the goals of the National Development Plan. So namely, education, childhood, childhood and youth conditions, labour, health and public utilities and housing conditions. Within these dimensions, they have to select indicators. So what criteria they, they use to select indicators? First, frequency of views. What does this mean? They went to the literature, they did a review of the literature on multidimensional measures of well-being and deprivations, and they found <coughs> indicators, they select indicators that came a lot, that were appeared a lot. They also got experts' opinions to, to give their intake on this, and that guarantee that the indicators they would select are indicators that are traditionally used for policy monitoring in other countries, in other ministries. Second, they also wanted indicators that can be changed. So they indicators that they, uh, through policy actions they can see change. Because if they have an indicator that they cannot influence, then maybe it's not so good to be there because I find I cannot do anything about it. Since I'm targeting the progress towards my goals, so I want to see what can I do to get there if I'm doing fine. Then they have a very good uh, survey, the Colombian Living Standard Measurement Survey. And so that's what there was already in place and they keep that as the main data source. But that means that they could only use indicators with information in that survey. Finally, after selecting the variables to guarantee to validate the variables, the indicators, to validate the indicators, they, they guarantee the precision of the sample to estimate. In base, what they did, they make sure that all the indicators they selected, the coefficient of variation was below 15%. Variables are cutoffs. And so what are their variables? In education, they use educational achievement. And uh, I'm going to say a little bit of the indicators also to have an example of possible indicators. So their educational achievement, they say that a household is deprived if the average years of schooling of all the household members 15 years or older, it's nine years of schooling. I think it's pretty high, but I guess it's Colombia. Literacy. A house is deprived if there is at least one household member older than 15, 15 or older, that cannot read or write. This is pretty. Oh, sorry. Childhood and school attendance. <coughs> this is the normal. A household is deprived between a child between 6 and 16 is not attending school. 
the gap, no school lag, and this is also interesting. So a household is deprived if there is a child between seven and seventeen that has not approved, that has approved to a number of grades below the average. So to see, it's not enough to be in school. We must be in school and passing the classes. <laughs> Uh, access to childcare services, and this is for a household who have be children between zero and five. So they would be deprived if they would not have access to childcare. Absence of child employment. That means also if children between twelve and seventeen would be working, a household would be deprived. <coughs> Labor. Absence of long term. A household is deprived if there is at least one person that has been unemployed for at least one year. And social informal employment, if there is a person that is employed but has no social protection. Health, if anyone in the household as of older than five has no health coverage. And access to health care service when needed. It's also an interesting one. It's if a person in the last 30 days was sick, ill, had an accident and did not go for health services, didn't go to the doctor, so it's deprived. Finally, the last ones, I'm not going to go through all of them, but what is interesting in this case is most of them, I think the, the only exception is flooring, they have different thresholds for urban and rural areas. So they thought, like, the, the context is not the same. So in the house, for, so in just in the first, the fir improved wa drinking water. Urban areas that you are deprived if you don't have tap water in your house. In the rural areas, is if you don't have a protected well nearby. Now I don't remember exactly, but you don't need to have tap water. Weights. They use the nested weights. Similar to the global MPI, they give equal weights to all the dimensions, in equal weights to the indicators within the dimensions. Because they think that reflects the equal valuation of all the dimensions. They tried other weights. They tried different uh, weight, weight schemes, but there was no consensus. So the experts, they didn't think that it would be a good move. Da -da -da. Poverty cutoff. On terms of the poverty cutoff, they did some statistical analysis to eliminate the extremes cutoffs. But then they had like a range, and now how do I choose in the range? And so what they did, they compare the median and average deprivation of the people who, were identif who identify themselves, who perceive themselves as poor. So what means like population would perceive themselves as poor at five in me median, the median of deprivations was five, and the average was five, also five, actually. Then the people who actually were income poor, so they compute. Then the people that were both, or the people that were not perceived as someone as poor, or uh, were income poor. And what they found, for instance, is that the people who are neither income poor, or they don't perceive themselves as poor, they actually have around three, I don't know all these points, three deprivations. So this, this suggests that having three deprivations, it's not necessarily associated with a condition of poverty. So they thought like we should have something a bit above three, because people who have three seems to be fine. And curiously, people who perceive themselves, so say, who are subjectively poor and are also income poor, have around five deprivations. So in the end, that was the consensus. In the end, you have to make a decision. But based on this information, they go with one third of the deprivations. So one third of the deprivations is their poverty cut off. Oops, 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 oops. But I'm close to the end. Uh, and there is so much more I could say about Colombia. But I hope that my colleagues in the next week, they will talk a little bit more about the policy applications. Because this, I've been focusing only on the, on the decisions, on the normative decisions, but they have been using this a lot. Here are some examples. So they have made poverty maps. So using the census data for 2005, they proxy the MPI at the district, I think it's this district, municipality, thank you, <laughs> the municipality level. And they made the graphs, oops. Oh. So where you can see <coughs> where are the areas where are higher level of poverty. And I think this is pretty cool, to be honest. But they also do policy coordination, and this is similar to what Gisela was also talking that it happens in Mexico. So regularly they have this high com official commission or a monitoring center that it's the ministers that regularly meet and look at the results. And who has to be also in this meeting is the president. 
So it's a by mandate, the president has to be there. And they look at the results and the each indicator and they, they have lights, like red and green lights, to see what's in, pro what's in track to achieve the goal, what it's not. And they together be able to coordinate their policy actions to put things in line. They track poverty, so the measure, this I mentioned briefly in the beginning, so the age, the, the, pro the proportion of multidimensional poor and the M0 are used to track the progress towards the National Development Plan. And finally, they also use it to targeting the beneficiaries of one of these programs. Actually, no, I'm lying. <coughs> they use to, to make sure when a family can get out of this program, has to be, the, the condition now is has to be non-income poor and also not multidimensional poor. So it's used on the targeting to get out. So this is it. Next week, we probably will hear about a little bit more about Colombia. Oh, okay. That's a good question, and I really don't know what to answer. <laughs> I don't know, but this is a subjective measure. So it's what matters, what they measure is that, is how people perceive. Of course, there might be a bias on the, the, way the answer, but it's how they perceive. So for that, that's why I think. Uh, there's many questions, there's some here, some there, I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay, so the first there, then. Okay, thank you. I'm a little confused with the justification. You didn't do this, right? It was another. Yes, the, I didn't. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You said that they chose five out of 15. Yes. I mean, that's a number of deprivation. It's not the percentage of deprivation, of the weighted deprivation score. And Actually, is that's a good point. Yeah. It's a very good point, but it's a share. So in the end, it's a share of deprivations. Because if you see the, 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 the weights, huh? so. Exactly. On the slide, it says the number of deprivations. So no, but here, it, no, the weights are normalized weights. So what you're going to have when you compute the deprivation uh, score of an individual in a household, mm -hmm. an individual, you will have a uh, value between 0 and 1. Yes. So it's a share. But they did yes, the analysis, not weight, but just with the numbers. Yes. But it's uh, in so the end. That's wrong that they did that. That's a good question. And I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> I don't know about this. Yeah, but I understand your point. So they should. So the point, what I cannot answer you to uh, precisely is if these numbers are actually the numbers of deprivations, or if there is a ponderation on the deprivations. But I don't. But I don't know. It might be. So that I'm sorry, I cannot answer. Uh, here in the front, please. Some of the, some of the variables are may generate missing values. For example. Uh, this access to health, as you defined it, the family member who was <laughs> was able to go to the hospital or not. How many people suffer accidents? Few. Or a, so a flu, it can be a, just an, an incident, but I, I agree. Yeah. So, so there may be many people in the, in the example who may not have fall into this situation. So how do you handle that? Uh, I don't know how they handle that, but I know <laughs> more or less uh, how, how we, we talk, we're going to be talking, be talking tomorrow about that. I would, what we do with the MPI, because the MPI can happen something like that. You might not like have children in the household, so how do you do school attendance? And what we do is we, we assume that they are non-deprived. So we, took, uh, to we take a conservative approach. We assume that the persons are non-deprived because they don't have people. And I would... I believe that that's what they did because there was people of OFI working with them. I would believe that it's that the measure that the, the topic. But we'll talk more about this type of issues tomorrow uh, in the morning. There is here. And actually, I want to just ratify my answer to you. I'm almost sure that they consider the weighted deprivations here. So I, I, although this says the number of indicators, I'm, I, I, I would find it hard to, to believe that it was not considering the weights. Please. Yeah, um, just out of interest, in the labor deprivation index. Yeah, uh, yeah, in the dimension. In the labor dimension, yeah. Yes. This is amount of unemployment, formal unemployment. Mm -hmm. How did you classify women performing unpaid domestic work at home? 
Who that because is? they're not formally employed question. or they're not really unemployed. What are they? Uh, I can only guess again. <laughs> uh, as we indicated, formal employment is if you are employed and you don't have social protection. I think they would be as they wouldn't enter there as even applicable for the indicator. Can I you have in yes, the, please. In the household survey for Colombia, there is a whole employment module, and so one of the questions is for people that are employed. So the housewife would say that she's not employed. So out of those who are employed, they go and they have a, a specific question asking whether they have access to social benefits or not, if they have paid vacations or not, if they have a formal contract or not. Mm -hmm. So they use those, that information, but only for people that said they were employed. Okay. So uh, housewives are not included in this. Okay. okay. <laughs> so there is only two more, and then we'll finish. <laughs> Thanks, Bhutan. Yeah, uh, a bit clarification. Uh, I thought Colombia is a middle income country. Yes. And if we really look at the indicators uh, that we brought here, it looks as if it's like for a developed country indicator. Mm. For example, if you look at the school attendance, yes. uh, nine years, average nine years in a household, that's really too tough. I mean, I agree. Uh, <laughs> I agree. Also the no. no school life. Latin America is not tough. No. no. Okay. I agree that it seems to me, but apparently not in America. No? Practically, if you look at uh, uh, literature, that could even be applicable for advanced countries. You know, nine years of uh, school attendance is pretty high. But on average. But uh, it, can I uh, just add something to that? Remember, this is a tool to track progress. Mm -hmm. So what I establish the goals that I want to achieve. If that is my goal, I don't want a measure that I'm, that I'm already achieving. I want to get to that measure. So I'm going to put my aim high so I can see how fast do I get there. So if I put a low, it doesn't matter for me, especially if Latin America has like lot, the, most people have high levels of uh, number of schooling years. A low will not help me design policy. So my goal is not having, when I start, is not having to have a low measure. I want to have a measure where I can improve, so I need to have to put the target high, because that's where I'm aiming. But please continue, I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, and also on the other issues, the long-term unemployment, how long in terms of years. One year. And the, and the formal employment issue, and the health insurance. Do you take, for example, the number of kids, most likely, uh, if if the household had, has got health insurance, mm -hmm. then automatically the kids should be covered under the, uh, the household head. I can answer I'm not sure if that is taken into account. It also. is, it is. So the deprivation is like, it's only deprived if there is at least one, one person uh, older than five that it's not covered. So it's not necessarily, it's by individual. So it has to be a member that it's not covered. On the unemployment is one year. Mm -hmm. So if there is a person that is an employed, unemployed for at least one year, the household is deprived. And the last question? Oh, just there was just a small question in the, in the <laughs> domains and the indicators. Yes. Uh, is violence and security an issue in Colombia? Or is it not an issue? Because actually that's my faint knowledge of, I have been to Colombia again, and I think that's a, that's a key issue there. Yeah? My answer for that is, Probably because they don't have information. So one of the selection of the indicators criteria was that it would be included in their living standards survey. Okay. But I know other cases of <laughs> El Salvador where they find that it's a, a, an issue and so, but they started behind. They decided what was an issue and now they are fielding the, the information. But, and the last question, because it's already before, it's really the <laughs> <coughs> My question is on weight. weight. If you're trying to calculate weight based on data that you've collected, and maybe for an indicator, the options are yes and no. That's what you expected. But when the data came in, you got some missing values. And what you're actually looking for is the, rest, the yes responses. In cases like that, you see that the data is incomplete because 
Where will you place those missing values? You don't know if it's yes or no. My question is, will you now still consider the only yes options to calculate your weight? I don't understand the, to calculate my weight. The weight value that you're trying to calculate for an indicator. Yes. You want to get it from the data probably you've collected. No, the, the, the weights that I'm deciding here, the, I'm, I'm deciding them even before. So they are normative weights. So I decided that each domain dimension will have equal weights. And then each the, uh, indicator in each dimension will have equal weights. So it's before the, the data issues. There are data issues. How do you handle with missing values? Not connected with the weights, but connected with other types of biases. But that we'll address tomorrow morning in another class. Okay. My second question, the last. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> From, I don't know if it is the Colombia or the Mexico, but there's this data about, this uh, presentation you had about income against the privations. It's this one, I think. I don't know. Is it? I'm not so sure which of the country, but... It's this one or... So it's the Mexico. Oh, so that's, you already lost your opportunity. But what I'm driving at is this. In developing countries where it's very difficult to estimate income, probably because people are busy doing their own things, the government is not in charge of how much income you get, people just survive on their own. I want to put it that way. And they are scared of really telling you how much income they get because of fear that government policies might change their income status negatively. So you don't tend to get an accurate value for income from household members. In situations like that, and you want to calculate the poverty level for such countries, what do you use instead of income? Since income, you can't estimate it. What do you use? What do I use? Uh, first, I, uh, with my case, is going to say, okay. <laughs> well, in the case of Mexico, it's actually a income consumption survey. So they stay five days with the in the house. The enumerator stays five days with the house, and they go day by day. What did you consume today? How much would you have paid for it? Did you go to the doctor? How much would you have paid? Did you use transport? Did you walk? And this, uh, it's a thorough information. It, it's, it goes beyond income. How much did you earn? How much did you receive in gifts from the government, from your neighbors? This is how this information is collected. Thank you very much. Oh. Can I add something? Ah, okay. Yes. So that's a good answer. <coughs> For targeting in Mexico, they ask, they based on the characteristics of the household, they make an estimation of the income of that household, and that they combine it with the other um, vulnerability, no, the other poverty dimensions. So they don't like rely on the what the household says in order to do the program. They estimate the income based on an algorithm. <coughs> All right, so now we will move way to the east and go to Bhutan. Um, so just to give a bit of context. Um, um, so Bhutan was, uh, has there as the most famous uh, index in Bhutan is the Gross Nas National Happiness Index and there is um, a tradition of uh, multidimensional measures. So. Uh, the, gross hash and the, the first Gross National Happiness Index came out in 2008 and the 2010 uh, index had nine domains and 33 <coughs> indicators. But uh, Bhutan has also had a tradition of measuring poverty using um, the consumption-based poverty estimates and they have been doing this since 2000. So there are estimates for 2003, 2007 and 2012. However, it was <coughs> Uh, there was policy discussion and what it uh, engendered was this, was this interest for uh, a poverty measure that was also multidimensional, just the way well-being was considered multidimensional in Bhutan, there was also a movement towards having a poverty measure that was multidimensional in nature. So that's how the movement towards a multidimensional, uh, for multidimensional measure for poverty came about. And um, the purpose of the poverty measure in uh, uh, Bhutan was uh, 
One was to target the poor. And uh, second was also to look at multidimensional poverty in, t in, in, in districts and in regions because uh, they had very specific targeting uh, intentions in mind for regions and for zongaks, as they call it, the districts. And uh, also the, the idea was to complement the income measure. And it, was, uh, it was very seriously to have a measure that complements what information was being provided by the income poverty measure that they had already been developing for, for years and uh, to measure progress. So these were uh, the intentions behind the uh, measure and this was the normative framework within which they were working with the measure. And the unit of analysis was uh, normatively decided to be the household uh, because the intention was very straightforwardly for targeting. Uh, it was the poverty alleviation policies would be targeted at the household level. So with that in mind, the unit of analysis was considered uh, to be household and, and that was considered appropriate for, uh, for targeting purposes. Um, the data sources that the Bhutan measurement uses is the Bhutan Living Standards <coughs> Survey. Uh, and it is uh, similar to the Bhutan, so the Bhutan Living Standards Survey, there is uh, there's information in 2007 and then there is uh, information for 2012. And the samples are very si similar in terms of their structure. They are both representative at uh, the Zongag level, in the, at the district level by urban and uh, rural uh, areas. And uh, the sample size was also similar. However, there were uh, some differences in the information available in terms of the indicators that were present. So there was some information that was not available in 2007, that was available in 2012. And um, so, so that was something that was, uh, since the intention was to measure progress, uh, it, when you are doing overtime comparison, it is important that you have similar indicators across time. And that was not the case between 2007 and 2012. And uh, so the MPI measure was first developed uh, around 2010 using the BLSS 2007 uh, survey, as well as it was uh, uh, again recalculated rec more recently using the BLSS 2012 survey. And um, to focus on the BLSS 2012 um, uh, measure, the idea of the poverty measure, the uh, multidimensional poverty measure in Bhutan was to keep it very close to the global MPI measure. And uh, although there it had been contextualized for Bhutan, there were certain key indicators that was important to Bhutan that was added. But overall, the structure is very, very similar to the global MPI measure. So there are three dimensions, health, education, and living standard. And in health, um, there is um, child mortality and food security. Now, 2012 data did not have information on the, um, child uh, malnutrition or malnutrition in general. So um, there was no information on uh, malnutrition, but uh, there, was, there, there was information on child mortality. And um, the important dimension in health that was considered uh, important in Bhutan was food security. Um, in education, it was school, uh, school attendance and schooling, and the definition was is exactly like the global MPI definition. Um, in living standards, there is, uh, again, the living standard indicators that we have for the global MPI, but uh, Bhutan also added um, three other indicators, um, housing, land, and livestock. Uh, land was considered important because uh, the king of Bhutan uh, had, uh, had declared or was discussing a policy of uh, giving uh, land to households that were below the poverty line and were landless. Uh, so land was, uh, again, also, as Sabina mentioned in her previous presentation during the participatory analysis and the participatory discussions, it came out that uh, land was considered an important uh, indicator of well-being for, um, for households. So the deprivation in land would be an in, in important indicator of poverty. Um, so land was, again, considered, uh, uh, was, was included in the measure. And livestock was included in the measure because, uh, again, it was um, it w through participatory dis discussions it emerged as an important indicator of poverty. Um, in terms of uh, sorry, on livestock, was there uh, thank you. Uh, on, on livestock was there any hierarchy uh, for different type of uh, 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 livestock? Because if you say cattle um, and three chicken, they are not equivalent. <laughs> um, yeah. A pig, and uh, you see. So, did you have uh, some sort of hierarchy, like uh, either one cattle, one cow, or 
one horse or ten chicken, something like that, that makes things equivalent? Yes, I believe there was an adjustment uh, because, again, like you said, ten chicken is not the same as two cows. So, so uh, there, was that, there was an adjustment for that. Um, but uh, yes, the adjustment was taken care into was was taken into account for that. If you want to know the details, then I think Sabina has more information on exactly how that was done. But yes, it was considered. Uh, there was, uh, you know, there was uh, it, there was that was taken into account while counting the number of uh, cattle, and then and to to come up with the uh, deprivation correspondingly with the measure. Yes. Household uh, has experienced uh, a child death. Yes. This household will um, forever deprived uh, in that indicator. So I think this indicator is not uh, a policy relevant indicator. It's it's not important or no no. The, but policy, but in uh, terms of policy, what do you do yeah, about it? Uh, yeah. yeah no, it, that's true. I mean, if, if child mortality, if you ask the question that if ever there was a child that passed away, then that household will continue to, there won't be a change in the status of uh, child mortality. So that is true. Um, but uh, so there is, the, there is a huge discussion even within, uh, I mean, amongst us in terms of looking at child, thinking about or rethinking about child mortality as an indicator. Because if you say in the last five years, then maybe you can see changes over time. But if you say if, if ever a child has died, then there won't be any change. It's not sensitive to changes. That's true. For example, in my household, mm. uh, years ago, uh, my mother's the f first son uh, has died, and so we we are poor <laughs> in this indicator forever. <laughs> Yeah, well, so, I mean, it, there's also the issue of, uh, you know, normatively deciding whether you want, whether, we have, whether you want that information. But also, in some ways, it's also how the questionnaire itself is designed. So if you have a questionnaire where you have the question that, have you ever had a child that's died, then you're stuck with that question. So, you know, you don't, uh, so it is, also, it is also a question of how the question was designed. And if you have a questionnaire where, and that is the case where, in the case of Bhutan, I believe that the living survey... No, I, com I agree with you. So when you design your question, eh, you should definitely put in a time bracket so that you c it is sensitive also, to change. Um, that's yeah. why the value of case is so important. Because yeah, that's true. Your case. If your family is not deprived in any other of all these indicators, but you choose the value of K equal to 1, so the union approach, the fact that 20 years ago one of your siblings died would in impact the result significantly. Now, if you ask for a value of k that is two or greater than two, then that, that would be adjusted in a way. Even if your household is non-deprived in all the other indicators, then if they are non-deprived in all the other indicators, then they are not identified as poor, even if the child died. Because we are also, in a way, controlling for these kind of uh, cases that, for which the data sometimes is not perfect. And the, to point out the food security question was um, the question asked that if the family experienced insufficiency in food in the past 12 months. So it was a perception based question um, because I think somebody asked about that. So in terms of weightage again it followed um, the global MPI quite closely. Every dimension was weighted equally so it was one third. Uh, each dimension was weighted one third. And within the dimension, it was again the concept of equally nested uh, weights. So the health dimension had two indicators, one-sixth each. And education had, um, again, two indicators, so one-sixth each. In terms of living standard, the variables asset, land, and livestock were considered as, you know, um, just for the sake of weights and for the normative judgment behind the weights, it was considered adding the similar kind of information. So because they're all asset related, so livestock, land, and assets, durable assets are all uh, speaking to the a similar concept of uh, having some sort of a stock um, in, and wealth at, uh, at home. So that was, if you, if you look at it from the point of view of being one indicator, then you have seven uh, different ones under living standard. And they were all rated equally, so it's one seventh. Um, so cooking fuel, therefore, all these six, um, indicators get 121 weight and then these within this indicator they're equally weighted so that's 1 by 63. Um, the idea was to closely follow the global MPI and uh, Bhutan is actually one of the examples where uh, you can see how 
uh, a measure has very closely followed the global MPI and a lot of the rationale behind some of the things that they've chosen was of course important normatively in Bhutan which, and it emerged as important through policy discussions but they also uh, the idea was also to closely mirror the global MPI. Um, in terms of the poverty cutoff, again the idea was uh, that uh, the, it would be approximately one third because the global MPI is one third of the weighted dimensions. Uh, the idea was in, in the Bhut for the Bhutan in, uh, index was also to have approximately one third of the weighted indicators. So K was equal to 4 by 13 uh, because there were 13 indicators and that came up to about roughly 30.7% of the weighted uh, dimensions. And so that was the K cutoff to identify people who were poor. They had another cutoff to identify people who were intensely poor. And that was um, approximately half of uh, the weighted indicators. So that came up to be about uh, 7 by 13 of uh, the, the K value was 7 by 13 for to identify people who were intensely poor. Uh, I'm going to get back to this graph again, but uh, this graph basically shows the different um, the M0 values for different uh, uh, cutoffs of K in the year 2012. And uh, I forgot to mention, but uh, the I, I should attribute uh, the slides to the National Bureau, Statistical Bureau of Bhutan because I've um, taken slides from their great presentation. And um, so in 2012, this, this is the, the M0 values for different values <laughs> of uh, K. And um, these are the headcount ratios uh, based on the different values of K for 2012. And uh, just uh, at a glance, you can see that between 2000 and sorry, the pink is 2012 and the blue is 2007. And at a glance, you can see that both M0 and M and headcounts for, uh, for every value of K went down between the two years, between 2007 and 2012 for every value of K, M0 is lower in 2012 than 2007. And again, the headcount ratio for every value of K is lower in 2012 as compared to 2007. But I'm going to go back to the issue of comparability across time in a bit. Uh, but just I want to carry on with some of the results from 2012 first. In 2012, uh, the MPI uh, value was uh, 0 0.05. And the headcount ratio was 12.7. Uh, and uh, the average intensity of uh, deprivations among the multidimensionally poor was about 40% in 2012. Um, and in terms of the poverty profiles, uh, this again, um, I, what I found uh, and I think is interesting again and goes back to the morning session where we were discussing censored headcount versus contribution to poverty. I think this graph makes it a little bit easier to even contextualize the exercise that we're doing in the morning where you see that um, in terms of censored headcount, cooking fuel is the highest amongst the indicators. So the people, the portion of people who are uh, poor, multidimensionally poor and deprived in cooking fuel is, is quite high. But in terms of contribution to poverty, it is not that, it's, it's not the highest because uh, the weightage of the, of the weight that was assigned to cooking fuel was much lower than the other indicators. So what we see in 2012 is that um, schooling, um, years of schooling um, ha contributes most to poverty because it uh, is about 30%. In terms of dimension, the education dimension was the one that contributed the most to poverty, followed by living standards and then health. And um, the other very, very interesting fact about Bhutan is the comparison between the income headcount and the multidimensional uh, poverty headcount. Um, this is uh, uh, just to show that these are these are uh, these are the people who are identified as poor according to the multidimensional poverty index, and these are the people who are identified uh, as poor in terms of uh, the income. It's 12 percent of the headcount for the income headcount uh, poverty headcount for Bhutan for 2012 was 12 percent, and uh, the multidimensional poverty headcount for Bhutan in year 2012 was 12.7%, so very close. However, the overlap between the proportion of uh, people who were, <coughs> multi who were being identified uh, as poor by income and multidimensional poverty was only 3.2%. So there was little overlap between the multidimensional poverty headcount and uh, income poverty headcount. So, it, so I think that's, that's quite an interesting fact about Bhutan is that although 
overall, the headcount was similar through both measures. The, the people who were being identified as poor using both, uh, both either of the measures was actually only 3.2%. So the overlap was quite small. And if we look at, if we compare the headcounts uh, using the multidimensional poverty index and income poverty by Zonggag, it's some, it's a similar trend appears where you, we see that um, in, in, in general over half of the districts were, uh, the, multi, the multidimensional poverty headcount was higher than the income poverty headcount. Uh, it's most remarkable for Zonga Gaza, where you see that uh, the multidimensional headcount is uh, almost 40%. Whereas uh, by income poverty, there is uh, there's almost nobody who is poor. And, um, and in general, we can see that the mismatches are large. I mean, for, for, most, uh, for, a, for a majority of the Zongags, the mismatches are quite large in terms of who's being identified as poor by the two measures. So this is an interesting fact about uh, Bhutan. Just to go back to the slide in terms of comparison, um, when over time comparison was done for Bhutan, um, like I said, that there were issues in terms of the indicators that were strictly comparable across the BLSS 2012 and the BLSS 2007 surveys. So in 2007, in 2012, uh, there was no information on uh, nutrition. And in 2007, there was no information on nutrition and mortality. So when we do overtime comparisons, we have to make the two measures strictly comparable. So, um, so, you, so you know, you, the, the weights, uh, change because you only have to, then, then you only, we create a measure, so mortality and uh, nutrition were both removed and the measure only retained the indicator that was strictly ac comparable across the two time periods. So the weights again get adjusted by that. But using those comparable measures, it's interesting to see that uh, poverty in terms of M0 value and headcount both went down over time between 2012 and 2007. And, um, in terms of the policy use, uh, Bhutan is, uh, has been very, very enthusiastic about the multidimensional measure and the usage of the multidimensional measure. And uh, from the 11th five-year plan, uh, MPI is one of the main criteria in, uh, in resource allocation to local governments. So by local governments, uh, we mean the governments at the, at the district levels and at the regional level in terms of uh, resource allocations for poverty alleviation programs and for other social security programs. And uh, the MPI is used as one of the main criteria for the allocation of such resources. And uh, Bhutan has also set a poverty eradication target to reduce the MPI poverty headcount ratio to below 10% by 2018. So that is all for Bhutan. <laughs> okay, so this is gonna be the last example, don't worry. We don't have a list of 25 countries to discuss today. This is the very last one. <coughs> and then you're free to go. So uh, this is quite a, 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 a more recent application. It was um, done by the, it's the South African Multidimensional Poverty Index, or what is usually known as SAMPI. And uh, it was developed by, by the uh, Statistical Bureau of South Africa. And <coughs> basically, oh, okay. So in the case of South Africa, they, uh, they had already some kind of uh, record in, com in cons constructing multidimensional indices. After the census of 2001, uh, they had what they called the provincial, multi, uh, the provincial indicators on multidimensional deprivations. But uh, those, were, those indicators were not, um, they were not uh, able to decompose by uh, to, to get the contribution of each of the indicators or to get their, um, the regional figures or the district figures. So in this case, they, th they thought the MPI was an appealing, or the Alkair Foster method actually, was an appealing uh, tool for them because it would allow to get better information for policy. It would be a better tool to guide policy. And at the same time, they started to see how in South Africa, in their, the context of their country, Poverty was started to be seen as a multidimensional phenomenon by the poor themselves. They were identifying multiple deprivations at the same time instead of, asking, uh, instead of talking only about not having enough income. And then they, they also acknowledged the fact that poverty happens in a lot of different uh, scenes. So there are political uh, consequences, economic consequences, social consequences. And so they were trying to um, to include all of these things into one measure in a way that income or the traditional monetary measures hadn't been able to do it in the country. 
Now, something important is that, uh, as it happens only, uh, as it happened al also in the other examples that we mentioned here, uh, the multidimensional poverty index in South Africa, the SAMPI, was not designed to substitute or to replace the already existing uh, traditional income poverty measures. Rather, they were viewed as a way uh, of get more information, of get a better understanding of the situation of the poor in the country, in order to guide policy in a more effective way. So the SAMPI was designed to be a complement to traditional income measures. And that's also the case in Colombia, in Bhutan, and well, in, in, in Mexico it was a bit different because they created a hybrid measure that is just combining both things into one index. But in the other countries they also kept income <laughs> measure, the, 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 the income headcounts, they were not um, replaced. Um, <coughs> Now, the source of information, as I was mentioning uh, before, were the census. Basically, they uh, realized that a lot, of a lot of indicators that are used in the global MPI, in the, the MPI that we went through yesterday, were available on the census that South Africa has been conducted since 1996. Uh, especially in the last two, 2001 and 2011, there were a lot of indicators available that were um, quite comparable between waves of census, and so they decided to base their measure on this information. And basically, they have not only information at the national level for 2011, but also they can go down up to the district level, and this is very important to, to get um, a better understanding of uh, heterogeneities or, or differences in the level of uh, of the living conditions in the different regions or districts of the country. And also they are able to get comparisons over time and to see what has been the trend in th these indicators that they're considered to be relevant. Now, <coughs> so here we have covered the purpose and what's the data source and, and then the, the next big step is decide which are the, indi the dimensions, indicators, weights and cutoffs. In the case of the SAMPI, they follow quite closely the global MPI, but they decided that <coughs> they actually wanted to adapt it as, uh, as much as possible based on the census data to their national context or to their national reality. And also they would have some restrictions in terms of the data availability. So these two things, both the national context and restrictions in the data available in census, were um, uh, the, the reasons why some of the indicators were adjusted in the case of the SAMPI they actually added an additional dimension. So they kept the three uh, dimensions in the global MPI, health, education, and living standards, and they added this fourth dimension that we have here, economic activity. I will go in detail about what the, uh, what's the particular indicator that they're using in a second. Um, <coughs> but uh, basically, when they had to decide then the, uh, the, the particular indicators, they were also quite close with the MPI in terms of definitions. And the same in the case of the uh, weights and the poverty cutoff. Here in this table we have, I, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but I, I will go through, I will read it in any case. Um, here you have the particular indicators, the deprivation cutoffs and the weights that were used in the case of, of the SAMPI. As you can see in the case of health, we only have one indicator which is uh, child mortality, basically because the census doesn't have any information on uh, nutrition. So they were not able to include this indicator. Now, in the uh, child mortality indicator is, is similar to the one we have in the global MPI. It's not exactly the same because it's considering the uh, deaths that happened at the household in the last year and for children that were under five at the time of the death. So it's not exactly the same, but it's quite, quite similar, in, uh, at least in conception. They tried to find another health indicator that was available in the census to complement infor this information. And they, at some point, they consider including uh, an indicator on disability. Unfortunately, the questions in 2001 and 2011 were very different. And they uh, thought it was more important to guarantee comparison across time rather than to include an additional indicator. <coughs> and so they, at the end, they opted for only keeping uh, child mortality within this dimension. In the case of education, they have the, the exact same indicators that were included in the global MPI, and the definitions are exactly the same as well. But of course, in the case of child school attendance, they look at the particular age bracket that is relevant for South Africa. So it's children between 7 and 15 that needs to be um, attending school 
in order for the household to be non-deprived. And then in the case of standard of living, if you count, you will see that instead of six indicators, they have seven. They uh, have si some indicators that are very similar, like in the case of electricity, asset ownership, uh, sanitation, water, and cooking fuel. But then they added also what's the fuel that it's used for uh, heating the household, because they consider that in the particular context of South Africa, it was relevant. And so households that are using paraffin would cool uh, dung or other are considered to be deprived in that particular indicator. And then in the, in the specific cutoffs that they use for water access and for sanitation, they uh, departed a bit from the cutoffs that OFI uses for the global MPI because, again, they were trying to adapt this to the national measure. And you will see tomorrow that when you are given a data set and you start playing around with it, you will also be adjusting this. You will also be choosing normatively which are the cutoffs that make sense for the country in particular that you're working on. And this is what every country does, and so did they. So in the case of water and sanitation, they decided that instead of using the, MD, the MDGs criteria, so for example, in the case of water, is, uh, instead of considering both water source and the distance of that water source from the household, they decided to follow what uh, they, they <coughs> sorry, to follow their um, reconstruction and development program, which set even higher goals in terms of development in these two areas for the country. So they, um, they, they, their normative decision in this case was in, instead of uh, following the global MPI or the MDGs or the, some other kind of ex international experience, they decided to use their own legislation and their own programs in place that were already setting the tone in terms of which were the goals in these indicators. Um, here again, you will notice that in the case of asset ownerships, they didn't include bicycle basically because that was not available in the data. And the, they are not included an indicator on flooring because again, that was not available. And instead they replaced this by the type of dwelling. So in this case, if uh, the, the dwelling is in an informal shack, traditional dwelling, caravan tent or other, the household is considered to be deprived and other types of dwelling are non-deprived. Um, so again, I mean, here they were following the, uh, the, stan uh, the standard global MPI, but adapting it, adapting it to their uh, situation, to the what determines people, to whether people are deprived or not in these indicators in this particular country, and which are the indicators, additional indicators that are relevant, and which indicators are not that relevant in this context. And this is exactly what you will be doing with your groups tomorrow. And then finally, in the last dimension, the new dimension that they uh, incorporated in, their, in the SAMPI, economic activity, they have an indicator on unemployment. And if they find that all the adults, uh, um, age 15 to 64 in the household are non-working, I mean, if they are all unemployed, then the household is considered to be deprived. Here, of course, uh, they exclude non-working students or people that are in the inactive population. Um, they, they are not considered here. Oh, and instead, in case, um, in terms of the weights, they, uh, in, in this case, they decided that they would follow also the, ne the, the native nested weight schemes. So you can see that all the dimensions are weighted one fourth, since they have four dimensions, and then they um, they assign equal weights to indicators within dimensions. Um, and at the time of deciding what would be the poverty cutoff, they decided to keep the 33% uh, the that it's used for the global MPI, basically following the, the, the standard that was set with that international measure. Now, these are uh, some of the, the, the basic findings of the SAMPI, comparing 2001 and 2002. As you can see, there has been a, a significant, a large improvement in poverty in, a, in this decade in South Africa. In particular, you can see that the percentage of people that are identified as multidimensionally poor dropped by 10, almost 10 percentage points from 18% to 8% in these 10 years. Um, and also there's a large reduction in the SAMPI itself, in the index, uh, in the South African MPI itself. But the intensity, A, Hasn't, doesn't, uh, hasn't changed all that much. That is the proportion of deprivations that are experienced on average by those who are poor remain barely unchanged. 
it did, it did decrease a little bit, or I mean, not a little bit, but um, 1.6 percentage points, but it's still uh, <coughs> quite clear from these figures that the, the reduction in overall poverty was driven basically by people that left the condition of, I mean, that left poverty, people that were poor before and now were able to, um, uh, to be non-poor. Uh, and this is also a very interesting table because here we, what they are presenting is the proportion of people who are poor that, fo that fall into each of these groups of intensity of deprivation. So how do we read this table? For example, here what they are saying is that in 2001, almost half of the poor, 49.4% of the poor, had uh, <coughs> deprivations, were deprived in 33.3 to 39% of the total weighted indicators. And they had around 8% of the poor that were deprived in more than 60%. So 8% of the population in 2001 were deprived in 60% or more of these uh, 11 indicators that they have in the SAMPI. And what we can see is that now there are the, dis the, the, dis the distribution here has changed. There are more people in the first categories, and these numbers have dropped, the numbers for the last two rows here which means that there are fewer people, there are fewer poor people that are now experiencing 60% or more um, of the deprivations. So they are still multidimensionally poor, but they are not as poor, or I mean the proportion of people who are severely poor because they have a very large intensity of poverty is, has been dropping over time. Here in this table, uh, in this pie chart, what we see is the percentage contribution of each <coughs> of the 11 indicators. This is what you were computing by hand in the exercise yesterday. And of course, it's, this is the percentage contribution. It has to adapt to the total pie, to the, uh, the 100 percent. Back in 2001, almost, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> uh, almost half of poverty was explained by living standard indicators. Uh, it was, well, 46% at that time. And then 20% was explained by educational indicators. And what we see is that in this 10-year period, what happened is that the contribution of education <coughs> dropped to 16%, and the contribution of living standard indicators also um, got reduced to 42%. So basically, the, these two um, dimensions are still the ones that contribute the most to poverty jointly, but their contribution has been dropping over time. While the contribution of uh, the economic activity or the unemployment indicator itself has, ri has rose over time, which they say that it's very well connected to uh, the, econ the socioeconomic condition in the country, basically that now em unemployment is beginning to be more of a crucial issue when determining poverty. Um, now, the, the, one of the advantages of using data uh, like, like a census or surveys that allow for uh, very, uh, to go down with the data, to disaggregate at some national region, is that we can get a better understanding of how, um, how things are different in different parts of the country. Like we saw before with the maps for Colombia, the same can be done here and even to a greater level of detail, to the district level, in the case of South Africa since they are using the census. And what we see here is that the regions that are um, with, light, with um, darker greens are the ones that have lower levels of poverty. Then it goes to the yellows and oranges and so this will be the area of the country with the highest rate of poverty and what we see is how these colors changed in the decade under analysis. What we see is that the whole country improved, actually. Right? We see that all the areas beca became greener and into the darker green even. But when we go down, when, when they went down to the district level, what they found was that <coughs> these gains were not uniform for the whole country. All the regions improved, all the most of the districts improved over time, but the gains were not uh, uniformly distributed. There were some regions of the country that improved much more than others. So, um, so basically this is very useful especially for policy because you can have a map like this not just for the, the, the general age, for the, the, the incidence of poverty, but you can have maps for particular indicators. 
So you can be, you can, you are able to see how different districts are performing in terms of child mortality in each of the educational indicators, each of the living standard indicators, and so on. And you can have a region in which child mortality is really bad, but then they are actually performing well in education. So they are going to need different kinds of policies in different regions of the country. And this is one of the advantages of the al foster methodology, that it allows you to decompose by indicators, by subgroups, by subnational regions, in a way that it gives you a lot of information for policy. And this is also why we ask you to compute all these decompositions. You did it yesterday, and you will do it then with uh, Stata, because just getting the H, A, and M0 is not enough information, actually. These are, it's the aggregate <coughs> numbers, and they are informative, but they are much more informative when we complement them with all these other decompositions, especially in terms of policy. Um, this is uh, one method, but it has, we have summarized that it, um, it, it, it fulfills different purposes. So all of the measures presented today draw on a sensor ma matrix. They use the Alcar Foster class of measures, uh, especially M0, and uh, with, they fulfill the actions that you have discussed in previous days. Um, some of them report a, a, H, A, and M0. Some others only report H. Um, they all are decomposable. They are all mixing continuous and ordinal data. And they have a national scope, but they again, they can be decomposed. Uh, or for all of them, the unit of analysis was the household. And the weights, uh, that there were different weight schemes, but uh, uh, obviously adapted to to each need, uh, but they are nested in dimensions. And uh, the last slide has some comparison about uh, um, on the different uh, normative decisions that, that you would take. So, for instance, uh, in order to take uh, to decide on upon dimensions, Mexico reflected social rights, Colombia reflected national goals of the uh, national development goals. Bhutan privileged the MPI dimensions, but uh, obviously adapted them to local reality. And South Africa also used the MPI dimensions, but used uh, primary component analysis to reduce and um, validate these dimensions. Uh, uh, in terms of indicators, uh, Mexico used the legal norms to reflect rights. Um, in Colombia, this was uh, the selection of indicators was based on literature, experts, the ability to change it, to change those indicators uh, in, by policy action and availability within the previous survey, <coughs> and precision, precision of measure. Uh, for Bhutan, we have MPI indicators again adapted uh, to reality, and in South Africa, it depended on the availability of data in the census. Um, the sources of data, again, probably uh, this was uh, um, for Colombia, Bhutan, and South Africa, this was something that was previously considered. So it would be probably a step, <laughs> a step one or, or a step uh, two. But for Mexico, they created a, well, they built upon a new, uh, an existing data, but they, create, they adapted this, this source of data. In terms of thresholds, um, whereas in Mexico there was a legal criteria, an expert criteria to set the thresholds based on general laws of health and education. Uh, in Colombia there was triangulation and robustness to check for this uh, threshold. And uh, Bhutan and South Africa adapted thresholds to local reality. In the case of South Africa, there, there was also uh, exploration with experts, confrontation, and consultation. And different <laughs> institutions have evolved from, from these measures. Um, I don't know if we have time to, for yeah. questions. Yeah, we have like 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Is do you have good hands? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
all the all the four countries that that have, uh, we had about uh, all the all the domains all the indicators are all this generated through one survey. Yeah, they are generated by one survey. So that's a requisite of the methodology, because you need to create a profile at the individual or at the household level, but all the data has to come from the same survey. And that's why sometimes there are limitations in terms of which indicators you can use, because all the indicators need to come from the same, uh, uh, the same instrument. Yes? And the, the follow-up question is, the, the global MDGs, uh, MD, uh, It's not very limited. It's not very limited data, actually. But we um, now we have better data because in the last few years there have been more surveys and the questionnaires have started to include more um, questions and more indicators. So post 2015, we will probably be um, adapting the, the, uh, and have a new MPI and uh, an improved MPI. Uh, but for now, I mean. Th those indicators that were decided to be used back then, uh, and the ones that we are still using in the global MPI, um, were in part determined by the data availability from surveys that were um, carried out up to 2008. And then there are many surveys after that that include m more information, and so there is the option to include more indicators at the moment. Just to add that the reason why it is required by the methodology is because you want joint deprivations of the household. So you want the same household, you want to look at all the deprivations of the same household. So you don't use different surveys. 